Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We are from Group 10 and we will be presenting about the Islamic legacy of Abbasid Caliphate in terms of science, architecture, philosophy, technology and conquest. I am Muhammad Rahimi bin Azizam and I will be explaining generally on what Islamic legacy is all about. First of all, Legacy is a term that is closely related to history. Where there is legacy, there is historical value in it. Legacy can also be categorized as something inherited from generation to generation. It has become a common view that legacy is a heritage of the past generation that is the guest of the present generation. It comes as a guide and reflection for the next generation who are concerned with the journey of a civilization. Next, the arrival of Islam is a transition of civilization that brings great changes to human life. They aims to bring mankind back to the true paths. Many facts are found in the Quran that contain the story and history of the prophets and apostles and it has a heritage value that is the reflection and gaze of the people who came after it. Besides, Islam is a universal religion and its holy book has dismantled the various terms of inheritance that have become a reference to Muslim in this century. The holy book of the Quran came with such unique as if to narrate the journey of human civilization starting from the Prophet Adam alaihi salam to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is recorded through the revelation of the Quran. The Arabs were the inheritors of the scientific tradition of late antiquity. They preserved it, elaborated it, and finally passed it on to Europe. The story of how this Islamic legacy came about is far from simple, and much research needs to be done before its details are completely understood, but the broad outlines are clear. Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Today, I would like to talk about the history of Abbasid Caliphate. The Abbasid Caliphate started with a revolution that secretly started before 750. The revolution led by Abu al-Abbas, which he referred himself as a Safa and the revolution succeed in 750. Abu al-Abbas was the descendant of uncle of Prophet Muhammad which is al-Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib. After he entered the city, he captured Marwan which was the last caliph of Umayyad Caliphate and he killed him. This was where the Abbasid Caliphate began. However, the Caliphate was not stable in Abu al-Abbas administration. In 754, he died from having a small box and replaced by his brother which is Abu Ja'fa al-Mansur. Abu Ja'fa al-Mansur was the one who should be called as the true establisher of the Abbasid Empire. The first thing he done was to kill Abu Muslim who helped them 
to conquer Baghdad at the first place. There are more than 30 caliphs under Abu Ja'far al-Mansur and the dynasty of Abbasid can be divided into two phases. The first phase is under the govern of 10 caliphs and the remaining caliphs was in the second phase. Some of the famous caliphs in the Abbasid Caliphate are as following. The first one is Al-Mansur who founded the city of Baghdad. Secondly, Al-Mahdi and the third one Harun al-Rashid, Al-Amin, Al-Ma'mun, Al-Muqtasim and Al-Mutawakkil. These are from some of the famous caliphs under the Abbasid Caliphate. Now, the important question arises, which is, what makes the Abbasid Caliphate a very huge and big caliphate collapse? Okay, we can divide the factors into two factors. Firstly, the external factor, which was the rate or invasion of Hulagu Khan, which represents the Mongol or Tartar. They invaded Baghdad and killed everyone in Baghdad. Secondly, internal factor, which was the weak political system and leadership, also economical problem and war of ideologies. The weak political system and leadership came from the last caliph, which was Al Mu'tasim and the empire of Abbasid are so big that they not able to manage all the subcontinents properly. At that time also some caliphate arise such as Ottoman and Fatimia. At the same time, there are war, war of ideologies emerge in the uh, uh, political leadership, basically between Sunni and Shia. Coming back to the invasion of Baghdad, Hu Lagu Khan in 1258 he and his soldiers, about 200,000 soldiers, entered Baghdad easily. Within 10 days, they killed everyone and lastly, they conquered Baghdad. al Mu'tasim then tricked to make agreement with him, but unfortunately, he along with his families and scholars were captured and been killed. So that is the end of the Abbasid Caliphate. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Ahmad Hazib bin Ridwan, metric number 172X609. In this video, I will explain to you about the Islamic legacy of Abbasid Caliphate to sciences. As Islam spread out of the Arabian Peninsula into Syria, Egypt, and Iran, it made long established civilization and centers of learning, as well as assimilating uh, and disseminating 
the knowledge of other cultures, Arab scholars made numerous important scientific and technological advances in mathematics, astronomy, science, chemistry, uh, textile, and others. But for this video, I will only talk about the four biggest Abbasid legacy of field in sciences, which are mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and chemistry. Okay. Mathematics. The Muslim inherited uh, the earlier knowledge of mathematics from Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, and Greece. Muslim mathematicians uh, altered the number of numbers, updated some mathematical uh, disciplines, and developed an almost new branch of mathematics. Now I will explain to you about Islamic scholars in mathematics. First is Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khawarizmi, or as known as al-Khawarizmi. He is a Persian mathematician, combined Babylonian and Indian numerals into simpler and feasible structures that everyone could use. He also explained the use of zero and advanced the decimal system for practical reasons. Both the terms algebra and algorithm owe their currency to him. Mathematical science has left ineradicable traces of the Muslim share in its growth. The terms algebra, zero, sefir are from Arabic origin. The credit for three gonometries discovery certainly goes to Muslim mathematicians as it was an alien discipline to the Greeks. Number two, in the beginning of 9th century in Baghdad, three sons of Musa ibn Shaki, which were Ja'far, Muhammad, Ahmad, and Hassan were mathematicians widely known as Banu Musa. Uh, who examined problems in constructing unified uh, geometrical figures. They were outstanding in the field of mathematics, astronomy, mechanics, and geometry and helped considerably in the development of major innovation and discoveries. It is significant that the Musa brothers joined, uh, joined the work and compiled amazing books on mathematics, astronomy, and geometry. Next, astronomy. The early Muslim astronomers obtained much astronomical knowledge by studying the classical Greek, Persian, and Indian. These books were rendered several times into Arabic. Now I will explain about the Islamic scholars in astronomy. First, the Muslim uh, mathematician Ibrahim al-Fazari. He was the first person who built an astrolabe. He wrote on the use of armillary sphere and made tables in, in, in accordance with the Islamic calendar. Number two, his son, uh, who is uh, Muhammad bin Ibn, uh, Ibn Ibrahim al-Fazari. Uh, he was also a mathematician who excelled in the science of the stars. He was an authority on the planetary motion. He rendered Brahma Gupta Siddhartha as Sindin al Kabir, and his tr translation became the main source of astronomical knowledge until the time of Khalifa al Ma'mun. Okay, number three, uh, among the astronomers, the outstanding one was uh, Habash al Hasib. He developed a method of calculating celestial distances exactly. Uh, Al Hasib also uh, was the first to make a table of tangent values. He developed a graphical method to find the Qibla, and Hasib uh, was the first to calculate the exact appearance of the new moon. Okay, number three, uh, medicine. Arab uh, physicians and scholars also laid the basis for medical practice in Europe. The main Arabian hospitals were centers of medical education and introduced many of the concepts and structures that we see in modern hospitals such as separate uh, wards for men and women, medical records and pharmacies. Okay, now I will explain about the Islamic scholars in medicine. Uh, first, is Ibn al-Nafis. Uh, he is a 13th century Arab physician described the, and he described the pulmonary circulation more than 300 years before William Harvey. Next, we have uh, Abu Qasim al-Zahrawi who uh, was a surgeon uh, who wrote the Tasrif which translated into Latin uh, and became the leading medical text in European uh, universities during the later Middle, middle Age. Uh, next, uh, we have Ar-Razi as the greatest physician of the Islamic world. He wrote Kitab al-Mansuri, or as known in Latin as Liber al-Martsoris, a 10-volume treatise on Greek medicine. Uh, 
uh, and also published on smallpox and measles. His texts uh, continued to be reprinted well into the 19th century. And lastly, we have uh, Ibn Sina, or was known in the West as Abyssina and the Prince of Physicians. His synthesis of Islamic uh, medicine, uh, which is Al Kanun Fitib, the canon of medicine, was the final authority as medical methods in Europe uh, for several centuries. This book helped physicians uh, diagnose dangerous diseases uh, such as cancers. He created a system of medicine that today we will call a uh, holistic and in which uh, physical and psychological factors, uh, drugs and diet were combined in treating, in treating patients. And the last field is chemistry. From the very beginning, Muslim scholars work on the alchemical principle formulated by the Alexandrians and further restructured it and aligned it with their own interests and need of time. Okay, the Islamic scholars in chemistry. First is Abu Musa Jabir ibn Hayyan, uh, or also known as ibn Hayyan, and he was the father of Muslim alchemy at Baghdad. Okay, he was not only universally recognized in the Muslim world but in the West as well. He was the founder of experimental chemistry and was outstanding in his laboratory work by examining and analyzing a great many substances. Jabir was the first to prepare sulfuric acid by distillation and he prepared mercury oxide and nitric acid. According to Ibn Nadim, uh, Jabir wrote uh, 306 books on chemistry but most of them have vanished and still 80 of these were uh, preserved in various libraries. Most of his books were translated into Latin in 12th century by western scholars and these words stand for the base from which the modern science and chem of chemistry was launched into the entire world. Next, Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi uh, in Latin al-Razi as mentioned above for his medical advance uh, he also was equally renowned in the field of alchemy too. He developed sutures made from animal skin known as al kisab and was the first to make mercury ointment. Arazi also used uh, refined laboratory utensils like beakers, funnels, plus uh, naflar lamps, uh, and others that led to the manufacture of modern-day scientific laboratory equipment. His alchemical texts Al-Asrar and Sir Al-Asrar are the most famous of his alchemical works. According to Ibn Nadim, he wrote 115 books and uh, 30 epistles, most of them on natural sciences and the healing arts, including commentaries, uh, abstracts, and, in, and refutations. In fact, it is clear that it was the this expansion that played a significant role in setting the place for the uh, for the chemistry for of the modern days. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So today I will be presenting to you about the topic Islamic legacy of Abbasid Caliphate in terms of architecture. Uh, before that, my name is Aizat Firdas bin Zorni and my metric number is 1728415. So basically, during this uh, Abbasid Caliphate, the buildings were characterized by architecture, decorations and lush dome roofs, arches and unique shim columns. I will be show to you uh, about how the decoration or the design during this time uh, their, building, their buildings built by using of ceramic bricks from Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Uh, as you can see, these two rivers were located at Baghdad, which is Iraq currently right now. Uh, meaning that they took the uh, sands, they took uh, bricks, uh, stone to build their house, their mosque, and so on. So in my presentation, I will be talking about these four points, which is uh, art design, uh, Baghdad city, ceremonial gates, and Samara Mosque. So let's take a look at the first 
style first design which is arabesque style uh, arabesque style is a form of artistic decoration consisting of surface decoration uh, the surface of the building consists an ornament or style that employs flower foliage or fruit and sometimes animal and figural outline to produce a complex pattern of interlaced style i think we are familiar with this design or this decoration as we always see this decoration at the mosque and the musalla and in my personal view uh, this design has give a big impact to the muslims architecture history as this design we still can see it everywhere in the mosque although the Abbasid caliphate was end for about i think 200 years ago uh, in this arabesque style also they introduced luster painting technique over a white list this painting then led to the development of ceramic decoration in the western world the second design is Mukarna style uh, this Mukarna style is series is a series of interconnected vaults used to highlight the exterior of minarets and domes see how the creativity of the architecture during that time isn't it beautiful now let's take a look at the point number two which is Baghdad city this Baghdad city also known as Madinat Salam and the secular city of Baghdad during its peak uh, this city has secular shape and surrounded by huge solid walls the caliph's palace was located in the center and a mosque attached to it meaning that beside uh, the mosque is beside the palace while the governmental offices were surrounded around the palace and mosque there are three layers of walls surrounded the city uh, the first one is around uh, the first wall surrounded the central courtyard the second one uh, surrounded the residential sites which the residents stay and the third wall were left empty uh, the uh, big channel or big drains surrounded the wall as it filled with water from Tigris and Euphrates rivers and during that time that population about 500,000 to 1 million as you can see uh, this is the picture as you can see the uh, mosque in the middle of the city and there is first wall second wall third wall and at the outside of all this layer there are a big shadow of big dreams which can see Tigris, uh, Tigris and Euphrates river now let's jump up to the point number three which is Chirimidal Gates uh, in Baghdad city, there are four gates uh, as the entrance and design of fitting certain destinations. Uh, the gates were named after the places such as Kufa Gate, Basra Gate, Sham Gate, and Khorasan Gate. The objective of this gate is to help the officials to detect and check the entrance and outing of the visitors. Uh, we can say that this gate play role as a borderline, and as we can see, see that it's uh, pretty much like uh, an immigration and this ceremonial gate was founded by the caliph al -Mansur. so this is the four gates as I mentioned before Kufa gate, Damascus gate, Basra gate and Khurasan gate and the last point is Samara mosque this mosque was built by the caliph al between 848 and 800 49 Hijra, which means around 5 years, with an area of 109 acres big, right? Uh, this mosque containing some pieces separated by octagonal piers supporting the deep wood big roof. I don't know how the design it is, maybe it's some idea of the architecture during the time. Maybe it's beautiful. The Samara Mosque was considered as world largest mosque listed as UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2007. Amazing, right? And this mosque also consisted with two fascinated minarets. The first one is Al Manawiya, and the second one is Minaret Abu Dhaf. Let's take a look at the mosque. Look at 
it's fast, it's very big, as you can see the paper is very thin in the picture, it's very small, right? So, uh, that's all from my presentation. I hope you get some ideas about how the architecture during the MSC can fit. And thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh uh, InsyaAllah we present the point about of Islamic legacy of uh, Abbasid Caliphate in terms of their technology and as we know uh, in Abbasid Caliphate there are so many technology was introduced and earliest produced by their scholar by the Arabic scholars uh, in the golden era of Islamic world in the Abbasid Caliphate era uh, the first and famous one uh, as we know the paper industry they are uh, biggest paper mill in Baghdad that make uh, in uh, Abbasid Caliphate and this paper making was adapted from China in the 8th century uh, some historians said that the, this paper making industry uh, was made after the battle of Talas between Abbasid Caliphate uh, and the Tang and the dynasty of Tang in China and the scholars also learn how to produce the text uh, in a large scale and the making of paper mill in Baghdad which is, is helps uh, the bookshop is have a lot of bookshops book industry uh, libraries and also a private libraries in Baghdad and Islamic world uh, and obviously this paper mill also play a key role a big key role in the preservation and spread of knowledge of Islam in Islamic world. The second one, in terms of engineer, uh, there are so many innovation industrial uses was, uh, was made by the uh, by the scholars of Abbasid Caliphate, such as hydropower, tidal power, wine power, and also a petroleum. Uh, this uh, and also industry uses of water mills in Islamic world. Uh, also introduced introduce in the 7th century the water mill uh, water mills as we can see uh, such as the above picture uh, and also the delivery uh, machine such as pumps uh, and so uses dam uses dams to provide the additional power to water mills and water rising machine and this technology uh, was spread from Islamic world uh, into the Christian Spain because uh, they founded the first recorded uh, fooling mills, paper, paper mills and fog mills in the Catalonia Spain that means uh, the spread of this technology of engineer from Islamic work spread to the Christian Spain and the, in technology in irrigation and farming industry they also in is uh, distribute in new technology uh, such as the wine mill as we can see in the picture uh, in the right corner in above right corner uh, the, in farming there are so crop uh, such as uh, almond and citrus fruit uh, and broke them to the Europe they develop, develop uh, new um, uses of rudimentary sectan uh, or known as a camel uh, in uh, irrigation uh, industry as we can see uh, a camel uh, in uh, above picture they also reintroduced largest three mustard machine vessel to the Mediterranean the Arabic sailors also dominated one opponent's time one shopping time dominated trade in the in the Indian Ocean Ocean until the 16th century after uh, before the coming of Portuguese and astronomy and in astronomy, Al Tusi and Al Fargani wrote uh, various of books about astronomy. Uh, Ibrahim Al Fazari also worked on the uses of armillary spare, which is used for the motion of heavenly bodies. Uh, they also found the way of calculating the celestial distance, the perimeter of Earth, also found the uh, calculating the diameter of Moon. They also worked on trigonometric ratios, formulated a table of tangent value, uh, the geography method of Qibla and finding the understanding also, and uh, navigating also in atmospheric phenomena, and also navigating on, uh, on the star. Uh, in medical and surgery uh, field, they firstly uh, treat, uh, translate Greek book on medicine 
uh, after then uh, after that they developed new method to improve medicine which is use of herbal and other natural material and the encyclopedia of medicine was made uh, the first was made in encyclopedia the gravity of tuberculosis was discussed al zahrawi was uh, invested many instrument uh, in the in the medicine like paint pinchers catheters forceps and so on ibn masawai also wrote on compass the earliest medical treatise on optal ophthalmology uh, avicenna also wrote the canon of me medicine helped physician diagnosis dangerous diseases like cancer and in optic field ibn haytham the person the first person earliest uh, discuss uh, about the vision of perception he also discover the reflection process and elaborated that vision take place when light is fall and bounce back to the eyes thus telling how the eye sees and this phenomena had in the creation of camera uh, i think that was from me for the technology of abazid khalifa it's a great technology in the 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 introduce and the earliest the earliest era make the technology so uh, make the technology introduced in this work so thank you assalamu alaikum warahmatullah my name is muhammad qayyim and i will talk about education first elementary the elementary school or kutab was an adjunct of the most if not the most itself its curriculum center upon the Quran as a reading textbook. The students were taught Arabic grammar, stories regarding the prophets, and the teacher in the elementary school called Mu'allim, sometimes Faqih, on account of his theological training. Next, institutions of higher education the first prominent institution for higher learning in islam was the baytul hikmah or the house of wisdom it was founded by al ma'mun which is one of the caliphate of the abbasid era besides serving as a translation bureau this institute function as an academy and public library and had an observatory connected with it but the real academy in islam which made provision for the physical needs of its students and became a model for a, for later institutions of higher learning was the Nizamia, yes, the Nizamia. It was founded in 1065 until 1067 by the enlightened by the enlightened Nizamul Muluk. The Nizamia was consecrated as a theological seminary or madrasa, particularly for the study of the Shafi'i rite or Madhab Shafi'i, the school of faith of Sha Imam Shafi'i and the orthodox of Ash'ari system. In the Quran and the old poetry form, the backbone of the study and the humanities or Ilmu al adab precisely as the classics did later in the European University. Next the adult education no no it's not the uh, adult education for the 18 years old people and above nah, this is the education that learn by the adult okay there are many circles which are uh, halaqa or assemblies assemblies trials and majlis Centering upon faqih, which is people or regal, a really religious person who understand fake or mujtahid, yeah, the Quran readers, 
uh, leech recurs uh, in the mouse. For example, our Imam in Mazhab Shafi'i, uh, Imam Muhammad bin Idris Shafi'i, presided at such a halaqa. Um, he teach at the most of Amr at Al Fustat, where he taught various subjects every morning till his death in 822. And every Muslim had free admission, there's no payment needed for it, to such lectures in the most, which remain until the 11th century, the extension school of Islam. Not only at the era, which is this kind of method being learned by the adult, but until now, we can see, especially when we go to the al Mos, we can see the Sheikh Al-Azhar or any or Mufti or any scholars beside the Halaqah. People study, people learn in the circle. Not only in Azhar, but it is around the world. And we, console, we also can see it in Malaysia which is Ustaz and his students uh, make a halaqa and teach in that halaqa. Last but not least is the bookshop. The bookshop as a commercial and educational agency also makes its appearance early under the Abbasid Caliphate. al Yaqubi asserts that in his time at 881 the capital boasted of a hundred book dealers congregated in one street many of the shop many of these shop like their modern successes in cairo and damascus yes we know cairo and damascus nowadays had published a lot of islamic books but at that time there were small a small booth by the most but some were undoubtedly large enough to act as centers for for connoisseurs and bibliophiles in conclusion the abbasid caliphate was a kingdom that can be said to be one of the most glorious times in the history of islam Therefore, it is true that the Abbasid Caliphate made many contributions for the welfare of Muslims. The Abbasid Caliphate and its Islamic struggle clearly aim at advances in science, art, technology, military, politics, and astronomy. The history of this age has given many lessons to muslims today the rise fall and contribution must be observed by every muslim in order to be used as a guidance in life